Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm talking episode 13 of season 2 of Arrow called Heir to the Demon. And yes, the, the H in that word is silent. I actually just looked it up on good old dictionary.com because I wanted to say it right. And uh, hey, speaking of pronunciations, have you noticed that now we have officially two pronunciations for Ra's al Ghul? I believe uh, Nissa in this episode pronounces it as I did, Ra's al Ghul, while the uh, other characters in the show tend to pronounce it Ra's al Ghul. So there, it's canon that how his name is pronounced is not even consistent within the Arrow universe. Um, now, I'm sure a lot of people have, and a lot of people have really been getting into a froth over this, and I, th I think it's kind of a ridiculous thing. Uh, you know, I, I think very few of us watching this show are um, speakers of Arabic, so the way we say it in English is probably not uh, wholly correct anyway. So, you know, maybe, maybe this is just a little thing that we just kind of have to accept and, you know, Let's face it, in a hundred years we'll all be dead and this won't matter at all. So, perspective. Well, perspective is what we're here for, right? You're here for my perspective on this episode. Anyway, uh, my perspective on this episode is this is a really darn good episode. This is definitely one of the strongest ones of certainly this season and maybe one of the strongest episodes of the series yet. It's just good. There's so much cool stuff going on. So anyway, let's uh, just kind of get right into it. And uh, actually this time I want to talk just about, about a few of the little details that I've, I've noticed in this episode. And then we'll move on to the more character-oriented stuff. Uh, anyway, first of all, the, the, well, the first thing I noticed this episode is... Um, okay, so the League of Assassins, when they go to other countries, apparently they fly commercial and... Argus is on to uh, Nissa's. Well, in the comics, Nissa's birth name is Nissa Rotko, and when she uh, joins up with her father, she takes on officially the name uh, Nissa Al Ghul. Uh, now, what's interesting is in the comics, Nissa uh, is was born and raised in Russia. She didn't know her father until she became an adult, and she tracked him down. And Ra's uh, al Ghul was significantly, sufficiently impressed with her that he you know, gave her League of Assassins training and all this other stuff. So, she's from Russia. Isabel's from Russia. I mean, coincidence? Uh, you know, maybe, maybe not. Just worth noting. Uh, anyway, so I, I do think that, you know, it's a little weird that the shadowy organization of assassins, like, flies TWA or American Airlines or whatever. You know, you, and, and apparently gets busted by airport security. Seriously? Sloppy, sloppy, sloppy. Uh, and I, pardon me, I'm looking down here at my notes to make sure that I don't forget anything that I want to talk about. Uh, one thing that a uh, viewer noticed, and I, I got a laugh out of, was in the flashbacks, Sarah's phone. Uh, despite being set in 2007, apparently Nissa had an android. Um... I, I think that's a forgivable goof on the part of the uh, the show's creators, but still, that 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 is a funny one. And uh, one other thing that I gotta say uh, before I forget about it, in the big chase scene with uh, the motorcycle and stuff, did you notice how Oliver kind of has like the air the bow on the handlebars? <laughs> I don't know why I liked that so much when he's driving that, but it just sort of looks like he's actually customized the uh, handlebars of his bike to look like a bow for no apparent reason. Um, yeah, I just thought that was a nice touch. It's a very comic book kind of thing to have in there. And anyway, uh, so this episode we also find out, and this is something that I, I talked about last time, how last episode we saw someone apparently slipping something into Laurel's drink. Um, I, I completely miss that. I guess that's uh, part of the hazards that come with uh, doing exercise while trying to uh, watch an episode of Arrow. So we see that this did, in fact, lead to Laurel having that OD, and that was all basically part of a plot to kind of lure Sarah out of hiding, which uh, did indeed work. So despite the problems with airport security, uh, points to the League of Assassins on that one. Although... If you're going to commit a crime, even with it's a rent, even though it's with a rental car, 
you might want to take the license plate off of that, guys. I mean, just a tip or smear some mud on the back. I mean, seriously, the League of Assassins getting their car caught on a security camera? Sloppy. Then again, the League of Assassins has not had a huge amount of success in Starling City. And uh, speaking of stuff that with the League of Assassins that doesn't make sense, okay, Ra's al Ghul, for whatever reason, released Malcolm Merlin. Why? Why did Ra's al Ghul release Malcolm Merlin? I mean, I, I, I really think we need an explanation of this. Now granted, Malcolm's still out there, and we're, we are cer almost certainly going to see him again before the end of the season. This stuff with Thea, yeah, we're going to see good old John Barrowman again. But I definitely think that needs to be addressed, because uh, nobody twists Ra's al Ghul's arm. Uh, anyway, so there was some nice stuff with this episode. Um, definitely got to see more of Walter Steele. And, you know, I'm always happy when we get to see Walter. He's a cool character. I really like him. Uh, I, I can't really say that I agree with Stephanie, uh, Stephanie, jeez, Felicity's assessment that British people are bad liars. And um, I think anybody who's ever paid the slightest bit of attention to British politics will find that statement quite hilarious. Now, of course, I'm American, so I only know the very basics about British politics. But uh, if, if you're over in the UK, we have this thing in America called C-SPAN. And normally it just shows you, like, literally what's going on in, like, Congress or the Senate, some debate they're having. Sometimes they'll show a state debate going on in the state uh, Senate. But every once in a while, you can turn it on and you can watch um, debates happening in the British uh, Parliament. And I got to say, this is, to me, just hilariously entertaining. Uh, British politicians, um, they're very, the gloves are off. In America, we are oddly very protocol driven. Everybody has to maintain an, a very strong air of civility in, um, in American politics, or in debates and situations like that. None of that happens when uh, British people get to be get get to debating it. But uh, I have gone massively off tr topic, so let's uh, bring it back. So anyway, um, cool stuff with Walter. We find out that Moira has chosen to pay off um, the the doctor that delivered Thea, despite the fact that what she told him about Malcolm being Thea's father is totally covered under attorney-client privilege. But uh, obviously, a, a hard-fought campaign was in the works. So I guess I guess Moira figured, you know what? We better um, give the doctor a little incentive to make sure he's not going to be tempted to spill the beans on this. So okay, that 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 makes sense. And I love how this ties into the Tempest stuff from last year. That was a really nice use of continuity. And of course, it got us another nice scene between Felicity and Walter. Those two have, you know, a really nice dynamic. But anyway, what that whole thing did was really remind us that Moira, well, what she has done, what she has always done, is try to protect her family. But the whole thing with her you know, trying to get Felicity, trying to intimidate Felicity. And I, I've read the interviews with uh, Mark Guggenheim and the other guys behind the show who even had flat out said, Moira may not, probably didn't even 100% believe what she was saying to Felicity. In fact, I don't think she believed a word of it. That Oliver will hate you if you tell him this. Moira was saying what she thought would be the most effective thing to keep Felicity quiet. Now, Felicity, as we have seen, is not a good liar. In fact, she's pretty... Emotionally, Felicity is very, very easy to read. Uh, you know, except maybe if you're Oliver, to some degree. I, I don't think he's quite jazzed to just how much Felicity likes him, but we're not going to get into the Felicity stuff too much, because that's not what we do here. But yeah, obviously, uh, it's... I did, I did, uh, my ears did perk up with, uh, Moira's reaction to, I know how you feel, the whole, I know how you feel about my son thing. So, yeah. But bribing doctors, trying to intimidate Felicity. 
remember, we gotta remember, this is, Moira is someone who, in order to protect her family, hired guys to kidnap her own son. Moira has good intentions, and the way we've gotten into Moira's head, and the, the way we've seen the more sympathetic side of her, it's something that, that sort of thing is make us, is kind of there to bite make us more inclined to sort of forget all the really bad stuff that she did. Remember, Moira had her own son kidnapped. She had, uh, what was that, Henry Cho, Henry Chang, or whatever. The, the Asian dude involved in The Undertaking. She set him up to be murdered by Malcolm Merlin. I mean, Moira is a fine, fine example of the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And Moira's always had the good intentions of protecting her family, but she has lied and manipulated and flat out set pe caused the deaths of people in order to do that. So, you know, Moira has not completely put that black hat away. And now she's running for mayor, and it looks like good old Deathstroke is going to step in and deal with this situation personally. Now, if you're not familiar with the comics, the thing you got to remember about Slade Wilson, a.k.a. Deathstroke, is he's really best known as being one of the, if not the best, assassin in the world. Actually, I think maybe Lady Shiva kind of counts as maybe the best assassin. No way, I take that back. She's considered the best martial artist. The best assassin is pretty much unquestionably Deathstroke. And now, well, Slade wants to hurt Oliver. And, well, if you want to hurt somebody, killing their mom? For most people, that's going to hurt. Now, we don't know that's what he's going to do, but... Come on, really? I mean, what better way for Oliver to get the horrible news that Slade is alive than to discover him trying to kill his own mother? And what's interesting about that whole thing with Oliver finding out the truth, it, and you know that really just brutal screw you to Moira, is Oliver's being more than a little bit of a hypocrite here. Oliver lies constantly to the people around him. Why? to protect them. The exact same reason that Moira did all of that other stuff. Now granted, well, okay, yes, Oliver has killed people. He's killed somewhere in the neighborhood of like 55 people personally. So, yeah. But Oliver has never... It's hard to make a case that Oliver has not killed anybody who was probably not deserving of it, or at least could be considered a bad guy. Moira, well... And I love how even Sebastian Blood is able to raise a legitimate point in this whole situation where he says, well, at the trial, you were playing, oh, I'm Malcolm Merlin's victim. And yet, here you are, Brady, go out there and say, like, I'm strong enough that I can lead Starling City into a better future. And he's totally right. Moira is really trying to kind of have her cake and eat it, too. I mean, her getting away with that trial was because of Malcolm Merlin. I mean, it's, it was complete and utter BS. So... Uh, anyway... Sorry, I'm just looking at my notes and trying to puzzle out what one of these means. Uh, but anyway, uh, nothing really to say about Thea this time around. She wasn't in, really in this episode, except to just kind of stand there. Uh, there was nothing with Roy this episode, although I did read there was a scene that was in the show that was cut. And what it was basically, and this will probably end up on the DVDs, was Oliver tells uh, Roy, go guard Laurel. And uh, that le leads to him having a fight with Nissa Al Ghul, where he puts up a good fight, but she's able to take him down. And Guggenheim even said, well, it was a cool scene, but it didn't really add anything to the story. So, again, I, I, f I fully expect that stuff will end up uh, on, as an extra on the DVDs. So, yeah. 
Uh, let me see here. Uh, well, you know what? Since uh, he's uh, our main character, let's kind of get in talking about what's going on with Oliver this episode. Now, we've already talked about what's going on with him and his mom. I gotta say, I, I totally love the scene with him and Felicity. I love how Felicity, she doesn't buy it. I mean, she obviously took some time to think the whole thing over, but she cannot be a part of lying to Oliver. And I love how Oliver just sees that, sees, like he, he's like his mom. He can read Felicity very well. And he sees that Felicity is worried, whatever she has to say, she's worried about ups damaging her relationship with him. And I saw one or two people online saying, like, oh, Oliver just assumes that the person Felicity is worried about is him. Like, this is some sort of sign of arrogance on Oliver's part. Like, no, people, come on. This is Felicity's smoke we're talking about here. You can read Felicity's smoke pretty well, especially if you know her well. And few people in Starling City probably know Felicity better than good old Oliver. And it really does speak well of her character and we'll get back to Oliver, I promise you, that Felicity does stand up for this. Stand up to you know, Moira. It doesn't bow to her intimidation. And I really like how this kind of really creates a bond with Oliver, because Oliver has just been betrayed, basically, by one of the people that he trusts most in the world. And I think he's really going to be leaning on Felicity even more for that sense of stability, for that sense of, you know, you are someone I can trust. And it's that similar mindset that sort of leads to him and uh, Sarah hooking up at the end. Now, because, and, and this is something I've really been expecting for a while now, because really, who but each, those two, who, for each other, for the, each of them, who but the other can really understand the sort of thing that they went through for those five years or so. Well, people like Issa or Helena, to some degree, yeah. But we all saw how um, how well those went. So, yeah. It really isn't a surprise to me that they kind of hooked up there at the end. Now, I saw some people complaining, like, well, how could Oliver do that? Doesn't he love Laurel? Well, yes. Laurel, obviously, will always hold a very near and dear place in Oliver's heart. Oliver cares about Laurel deeply. And yes, you can say that Oliver loves her. But there is no relationship in, in a romantic sense between her and Oliver. That boat, they tried to get back on that boat last year, and it sunk just as bad as the Queen's Gambit did. Ain't happening. And both uh, Moira, both Oliver and Laurel have made efforts at pursuing romantic interests besides each other. I mean, Laurel, for a lot of last season, was heavily involved with Tommy. Oliver took a stab at the relationship with Elena. He had the relationship with McKenna. So, just because Oliver cares about Laurel, just because there is love in his heart for her, does not mean that he's, you know in a relationship where he cannot pursue a, a situation where he cannot pursue a relationship with another person. Now, under the circumstances, that person being her sister, yeah, that's not going to go over well. But, at the end of the day, Oliver and Laurel are not in a relationship. Sarah, Laurel gets no say in this. All right, This is totally a choice between Sarah and Oliver. Now, granted, this is going to go over like a lead balloon with Laurel. But, well, relatives approving who you date? Yeah, you know, kind of screw that. And, man, you know, I loved one comment I saw from somebody that I, and it really echoes my own feelings, is that, it's kind of sad that Laurel, the more she's an enormous jerk, the more interesting she is. And, like, when she starts screaming at Sarah after finding out that she's alive and all this other stuff, like, get out, get out of here. You notice that's not actually at Laurel's apartment? Apparently that's at Quentin's house. 
Though I thought he lived in an apartment or something. Uh, yeah, whatever. So basically, she's kicking her sister out of her dad's, ho out of her parents' house, or you know, maybe her mom hold held onto it. Like wh whatever. She's she's kicking Sarah out of a place that's not even her own home, and Quentin just sort of stand, and her parent and her mom just sort of stand there and don't say anything about it. Uh, now, granted, under the circumstances, trying to get on Laurel's case about that whole situation, that's just going to make a bad situation worse. And I think that uh, Quentin and Diana were smart enough to realize that. Oh, and also, points to Quentin this episode. He takes the whole, oh, my daughter had a relationship with a woman thing takes that quite well, and he's even... And granted the whole thing, well, I'm glad you had somebody to love who loved you during this very hard time in your life. Well, that, 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 that's kind of schmaltzy, but, yeah, you know, family is, small, is schmaltzy sometimes. And honestly, I think that's the sort of thing that Sarah needed to hear. You know, she needed that I love you no matter what from Dad. Um, not a whole lot for uh, Alex Kingston to do this episode, which is sort of disappointing, because we all know from Doctor Who that she is a phenomenal actress. But, you know, some t there's the hazards of being a supporting character, right? Especially a minor supporting character. I mean, this is only like her second appearance on the show. So, yeah, you don't get to marry the main character in every show you do, right? Right, Alex? But anyway, uh, let me see here. Yeah, let's let's. Well, we might as well talk about Sarah. Uh, first of all, I gotta say uh, that scene on the Salmon Ladder. I was watching that scene very closely, you know, totally for reviewing purposes. And I'm not 100% sure if that was Katie Lotz or a stunt woman, but either way, uh, I have now ha officially had a a male and female on the show make me feel like uh, a cup of pudding in terms of physique. It's like, damn you Stephen O'Well for being able to do that salmon ladder in real life. You make me feel like such an out of shape lump. Ugh. Oh man. Definitely gotta get back on uh, definitely gotta start spending some time on the treadmill or something. Well, <laughs> exercise. Anyway, but yeah, one thing that I liked about this episode, and if you think about it, this is a little bit of a theme in this episode, is we get to see the more human side of, of all things, the League of Assassins. We see that Sarah's relationship with Nyssa genuinely means something to Sarah, despite the horrible circumstances under which this relationship arose. Obviously, Sarah is extraordinarily dear to Nyssa, despite what she is, you know, the situation here, and, you know, the whole um, trying to kill her thing. And what's even interesting is the guy that poisoned Laurel's drink. Well, he's one of the assassins that comes after them. And when they defeat him, he's, he starts praying in Arabic and before drinking his poison. And even that shows a human side to the members of the League of Assassins. And well, there's, all, of course, all that stuff with Malcolm Berlin, too. Now, I did see one Muslim guy uh, on Twitter who said, you know, I saw that guy, the Muslim assassin, praying, and I was really offended by that because it's, you know, oh, yeah, well, of course the Muslim person is an assassin. And, you know, I don't mean to denigrate this guy's feelings, but I can't really say that I agree with his objection there. Given what we know of the location of Nanda Parbat, which you know, being somewhere unclear in Central Asia, well, that's a place where a lot of people are Muslims. Obviously, the League of Assassins has people from all over the world who are members, which would almost certainly include people who are Muslims. And just the fact that their leader is Ra's al Ghul. I mean, it's established. He's um, an alchemist in ancient Arabia. I forget if they ever said exactly where. But, you know, he is himself is of, you know, Middle Eastern stock. So, and we know that, you know, Laurel, uh, that uh, Sarah learned to speak Arabic in the League of Assassins. So, that there is a Ara Arabian Muslim influence strongly present in the League of Assassins, 
that's that's just kind of a given. Now, again, I understand how this guy, as a Muslim, might feel that way, but it makes sense in terms of storytelling. And I will give the fellow credit. He did acknowledge that, under the circumstances, it was a way of humanizing this assassin, this nameless person who has no real role behind you know, trying to kill people. So, let's just call it agree to respectfully disagree between me and this guy on that one. But I did think that it's it's a point worth considering. But it, it, it's not a complaint that I really can get behind. So, let's respectfully leave it at that, okay? We're all friends here. We're all geeks. There's no need to really get at each other's throats about this, okay? Reasonable people. Reasonable people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, act I'm asking comic book fans on the internet to be reasonable. I might as well be trying to scoop out the ocean with a cup. But the effort must be made, right? Uh, anyway, um, oh yeah, I, can't, I almost forgot to say, we got to see the canary cry again. Yes, I love it. I gotta say, folks, I'll say, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I don't want Laurel to be Black Canary. I want Sarah to stay Black Canary. Find some other destiny for Laurel. Let her, let her become Manhunter. Let her just be, be a cool lawyer girl. You know, let her be like, the She-Hulk, but without the superpowers of the Arrow universe. You know, let, no, let her be Matt, Matt Murdock. You know, Matt Murdock in the Marvel universe is the suit is the guy that all the superheroes go to when they need a lawyer. I mean, yeah, okay, Matt Murdock is also Daredevil, but let Laurel be that person. You know, before in the comics, it was always Jean Loring that the superheroes would go to when they needed an attorney. And of course, then she went insane and became Eclipso and you know murdered elongated man's wife and stuff. Um, spoilers. Spoilers. Oh, so a fitting with a so fitting with an, for an episode with Alex Kingston in it. Uh, would you be surprised to know that it's actually been at least four hours since I've had coffee? It's, it's all me, folks. All me. Uh, anyway. Oh yeah, Vigilante Club. That was another great one. I love that line. Uh, but anyway, looking over my uh stuff. Oh, yeah. How could I forget? When I was talking about Felicity earlier. Here we finally start to get some idea of Felicity's backstory. We find out that she didn't really know her dad. She was raised by her mom who she apparently has a complicated relationship with. And this is something that people have kind of been complaining about for a while. And it's not that this is not a legitimate complaint. But what we have to keep in mind is that Felicity was not intended to be a major character. I mean, she was basically just kind of intended to be a one-shot character. And the people behind the scenes at the show and just the fans really fell in love with her. They ended up bringing her back. And, of course, she was a, Emily Rickards was bumped up to you know main cast member this, episode, this season. But a show like Arrow is one that requires a lot of plotting out. In fact, uh, I was reading one of the interviews with the producers this, um, today, and they even said, we're actually setting stuff up that will pay off in Season 3. Now keep in mind, folks, Arrow has yet to be renewed for a third season. So the producers are genuinely making a real gamble on that. But I think it's a real testament to their faith in the show, and... Well, let's face it, the show's been doing pretty darn well. That, But it's also a testament to really good writing that they're willing to set things up that are not going to pay off until next season. And the cool thing about that is, not everything, if they do it, like, if they do that, then not everything gets tied up in a neat little package. This whole series becomes more of an intricate web. It's kind of like Game of Thrones that way, or Song of Ice and Fire, or you know, whatever where stuff is planted in one book that doesn't pay off until quite sufficiently later. That's real writing. That's real mythology. And I love stuff like that. I mean, if you want to see a show that was a fantastic example of that, look no further than Babylon 5. That was a show where J. Michael Straczynski, the writer, came in and said, 
I'm going to do this show for five seasons. And that's it. And that is exactly what he did. And if you go back and watch all of that, you see over time that there is this genuine, real plan that you can see unfold over time. And things connect. They go back over seasons and across seasons. Stuff is set up and it doesn't pay off for hugely later. It's great stuff. I mean, Babylon 5 was a show that certainly had its flaws, but you cannot deny that it was a show that went in there with a roadmap and executed it. And I really don't think that show gets enough pr a credit for what a landmark in U.S. TV history that was. But anyway, uh, let me see here. Uh, just looking over my notes one more time. And yeah, folks, I think that covered uh, covers everything I've got to say. I've been talking for like half an hour here, and uh, I really need to go and get some water. My uh, cup here is pretty much empty. So, guys, really, really good episode. Now we have both uh, Sarah and Roy on Team Arrow, and I think that's going to be an interesting situation because Felicity and Dig were very much willing to follow Oliver's lead. I mean, they'd call him out when he was being a jerk or, you know, on his BS. But Roy and Sarah, they're, they come from very different places than Felicity and Dig. They're people who, you gotta think, are gonna have their own ideas about things. Like, Sarah does not remember, you know, she doesn't have a dead best friend to hold back on that whole no-killing thing. And Roy, well, we've already seen that he's he's tends to go off and do his own thing unless he feels, uh, you better give me a darn good reason as to why I need to do this. Uh, so yeah, I think there's, um, there's going to be some disagreement going on in the good old Arrow Cave in the near future. Anyway, guys, that's all I got for you this time around. As always, please comment, rate, and subscribe, and of course you can follow me on Twitter at Who's Your Jedi. Until next time, take care and have a good one.